Curtis LeMay is a bullheaded problem solver. And uh, he's a veteran of the bombing campaign in Europe for the uh, U.S. Air Force there, flying B-17s. And so when the Americans have these problems bombing Japanese cities and are looking for somebody to solve this problem, he's brought in. And so he changes the bombing doctrine from high altitude daylight bombing to low altitude, altitudes of about five to 10,000 feet, uh, flying at night and also changing the type of bombs that they carry. They switch to incendiary uh, bombs, which includes napalm. And so they are burning cities down. Many cities in Japan were made of wood. You find that the number of casualties in the cities among civilians begins to rise. Uh, in the first bombing campaign uh, over Tokyo, it's estimated that he killed anywhere from 50 to 100,000, the first bombing mission. There are some people that would suggest that the numbers of people killed in his bombing campaign exceeds half a million. It is also believed that it the success of his bombing campaign in Japan that influences General Kini, who is MacArthur's right-hand man and uh, the man in charge of the air campaign in the South Pacific. And so we believe that because of the success LeMay has, Kini adopts the bombing campaign doctrines for the bombing of North Borneo. Robert McNamara is a very important character when we talk about the bombings of North Borneo um, and also how it's related to the bombings of Japan, uh, especially with military doctrine, the bombing doctrine. Uh, Robert McNamara served in the US Air Force as an officer under LeMay and had great insight into what was going on behind the scenes and the bombing doctrine, the bombing campaign and LeMay's train of thought. At the end of the war, the roles are reversed. He eventually becomes Secretary of the Defense uh, for the United States government. And LeMay serves under him as head of the U.S. Air Force. And so when you listen to McNamara, he will explain a narrative that I think resonates with many of us as to the thinking and thought with relation to fighting the war against the Japanese. What is clear in the bombing doctrine before the launch of Operation Obo 6 to retake uh, North Borneo uh, and Brunei is that uh, there are no clear instructions given to bombing crews not to bomb any towns or civilian homes, villages and places of worship. What they have indicated is that places to be avoided being bombed are uh, hospitals, POW camps, um, piers and docks and uh, unfortunately it is open season on towns and villages and so if you look at the data which I have shared it is very obvious that it is open season on pretty much any target of opportunity be it civilian or military. In the next video that you will be watching uh, this is a very rare uh, but absolutely crucial video of B-25H model Mitchell medium bombers making a uh, low bombing mission and a strafing mission over Cunningham in June 1945. Uh, you will know that the aircraft are flying at treetop level and remember that this particular model of Mitchell has uh, machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns, four of them on the front nose cone as well as a 75 millimeter cannon and a crew uh, that are manning um, 50 caliber machine guns on both sides of the aircraft firing out of the aircraft and twin 50 caliber machine guns in the rear of the aircraft where they have a rear gunner seated. If you listen very carefully to the background sound, you can hear the 50 caliber machine guns firing. It is the front machine guns that are firing as well as the gunners on the side of the aircraft and the rear gunner as well firing. Now with the rear gunner position, you can actually see the white trail smoke coming up from the 50 caliber machine guns as he fires as the aircraft flies past targets. You will take note of how long they are flying over Kaningao and how much gunfire and firing they're making. So. If you would assume that the Japanese uh, were stretched over a 10 kilometer area in Kaningao, which of course is not possible and not logical, 
uh, or that they were merely attacking the Japanese airfields. And there were two airfields in Kaningao, one in Kaningao itself and one in Binkor. Um, that too makes no sense as well. And so what we have come to, the assumption is that they are firing randomly. Not only are they attacking the Japanese airfields and they're firing on the Japanese airfields, they're firing on any building, any structure in the vicinity of their flight path. And so if you have villagers living along the route and you have the door gunners, um, the rear gunner, and then the, of course the, gunner, the pilot firing the front guns, it is very likely they are going to hit civilian homes and buildings as well as individuals as well who are not Japanese soldiers and not combatants. <laughs> On June 21st, Mitchells of the Jungle Air Force bombed Kenegao on North Borneo. 3,200 rounds of 50 caliber ammunition and 100-pound general-purpose bombs were used to strop and bomb the town itself and two airstrips. The Japs were attempting to repair the fields in order to fly Jap officials out of Borneo before the invasion engulfed them. But with the Kenegao airdrome hit on five different occasions during the week and our Air Force controlling Borneo skies, evacuation by air was virtually impossible. This uh, photograph taken from a B-24 American bomber on a bombing mission uh, over Sandakan in June 1945 is an excellent capture of a bombing mission on the northern end of Sandakan town, which is Kampung Sim Sim. In the uh, boxes that I've highlighted, you will note that um, those areas are primarily village areas, uh, which is also today still Kampung Sim Sim. Now, if you were to look at a Google Earth snapshot of the same area, uh, today you will note that that is Kampung Sim Sim and it hasn't changed since the Second World War, except that it has expanded in size. Now, in the, the aerial photograph taken during this particular bombing mission, you will note the bombs are landing in the village area itself, the village homes. So these homes are made primarily from wood and so bombs dropped if there is a strategic target or a necessary target there, more than likely um, it would involve um, injury or deaths to civilians living in these village homes in Kampung Sim Sim. Uh, you will also note that I've circled um, a bombing strike on the harbour area in Sandakan town as well. If you look to the left of the photograph, the uh, you will note that some bombs are landing on the adjacent hill overlooking the uh, bay and Bahala Island. And uh, those bombs obviously uh, either miss their target or they are targeting possibly Japanese outposts on the hill. Um, but the most crucial part of this photograph is that the bombs are landing within the village areas and you can see the white smoke rising from the village areas where the bombs have struck. Another bombing mission gone astray is the bombing of Brunei town in June, uh, early June 1945. There were clear instructions given to all air crews and commanders that uh, Brunei town was not to be bombed. And this is very clear in the invasion doctrine, but for some reason, um, six bombs were dropped by Australian Bu fighters on Brunei town. Uh, we are, however, unsure of the number of casualties and the level of damage uh, in the town uh, based on this particular photograph that was recorded by one of the air crews after the bombs were dropped on Brunei. If you were to look at the statistics, for bombing missions by the uh, 13th Air Force or the Far East Air Force under General Kenny. You will note that Jesselton town is 
bombed and strafed at least 15 times. This includes Pinampang and Mangatal as well as Inanam. The airfield in Jesselton is bombed and strafed at least 18 times. Sandakan airfield is bombed and strafed at least 6 times, while Sandakan town and the areas around Sandakan are bombed and strafed at least 17 times. Kudat town is bombed and strafed 17 times, while the airfield is bombed and strafed at least 7 times. Labuan airfield or the two airfields in Labuan are attacked and bombed at least 15 times. The town is bombed twice given the size of the town and how minute and condensed it is. Kaningao and the two airfields are attacked at least six times while Kaningao town is attacked and strafed at least four times. Ranao is attacked at least three times towards the end of the war. During World War II, um, the use of the word precision bombing was laughable because the general belief was that if they could destroy the primary target, then it was a successful mission. Now, in this regard, this doesn't take into account the damage and destruction and deaths or injuries to those living in buildings or homes surrounding the target, as this video will demonstrate. Bombing a particular area, especially in a civilian area, is not precision bombing. It is carpet bombing. And so the question must be asked, were these bombings genuinely necessary? Did the Allies need to destroy Jesselton, Sandakan, Labuan, Kudat? Did they need to strafe and shoot machine gun Kaningao town? Were these genuine military targets? And this is one of those debates that will continue for time to come. Some would argue it was absolutely necessary in defeating the Japanese. Others will argue no. It wasn't right because these were not genuine military targets. Civilians are not military targets. And if we go back and look at LeMay's doctrine where he changes Allied military doctrine in the bombing of Japan in the destruction of North Borneo towns, there are similarities by destroying all towns the Japanese happened to be in or around. Was it morally right? Was it necessary? The choice of incendiary bombs, where did that come from? I think the, the, the issue is not so much incendiary bombs. I think the issue is, in order to win a war, should you kill 100,000 people in one night by firebombing or any other way? LeMay's answer would be clearly yes. 
McNamara, do you mean to say that instead of killing 100,000, burning to death 100,000 Japanese civilians in that one night, we should have burned to death a lesser number or none, and then had our soldiers cross the beaches in Tokyo and been slaughtered in the tens of thousands? Is that what you're proposing? I don't fault Truman for dropping the nuclear bomb. The U.S.-Japanese war was one of the most brutal wars in all of human history. Kamikaze pilots, suicide, unbelievable. What one can criticize is that the human race prior to that time and today has not really grappled with what are, I'll call it the rules of war. Was there a rule then that said you shouldn't bomb, uh, shouldn't kill, shouldn't burn to death 100,000 civilians in a night? LeMay said if we'd lost the war, we'd all have been prosecuted as war criminals. And I think he's right. He and I'd say I were behaving as war criminals. LeMay recognized that what he was doing would be thought immoral if his side had lost. But what makes it immoral if you lose and not immoral if you win?